And good evening. Good evening, Pastor. Nice to see you tonight, too. Wonderful. I hope you're doing well. Had a great day. And uh, looking forward to a wonderful time tonight in the house of the Lord. It's Bible study night. And we need Bible study. And we need this evening as well. Hope you got your prayer sheet as we'll take some time here while others are coming in and making their way in, in from the city and getting themselves situated. And some are coming from dinner as well. And this will give us an opportunity to um, bear one another's burdens and go before the throne of grace. Um, some upcoming announcements and events that I would love to be able to share with you tonight is don't forget tomorrow we have our Senior Saint Luncheon. If you're 55 years or older, we are invited. Pastor, I don't like being called a Senior Saint at 55. I understand, but you know, it just, I don't know, it just um, is what we do around here. But you'll have a great time. We're asking you to bring a main dish. Church will provide dessert and come and fellowship and eat with us. Um, it should be just a, a wonderful blessing. I know it's the last week of August. I'm not sure where everybody is, but hopefully we're back from the summertime. Uh, you see, and in, moving into September now, no evening service this Sunday night. Uh, it's Labor Day weekend, and so we're going to take that Sunday night off. I understand there's a storm out there, and we've been looking at that. Um, I, I've been around 25 years in South Florida. Anybody been around in South Florida longer than 25 years? So everybody's handed up knows that it's probably going to go north, right? That's usually what it does. I'm not falling in the trap of going out there and spending $1,000 to get ready and then have that thing go up to, and then I'm left with all that water to drink. So when I see it coming down Sunrise Boulevard, Beverly will put our shutters up and we'll be just, <laughs> we'll be just fine on how that's going to happen. Um, people ask me, Pastor, what's the church's position when a storm comes in as far as having services? Normally what we do is if it's a tropical storm warning, not a watch, but a warning or more, then we're probably going to shut down. Tropical storm watch just means that it'll be a little windy and so on and so forth. So if they throw warnings up for us and so on, then you may want to check up on, on us what we're going to do. But normally, we'll, right now, we're planning on having our Sunday morning services. I think, if anything, we would feel it would be later than that. But check in, and uh, if you feel like you need to, we'll put it out through social media and email and all of that. Um, September 4th, now, a week from tonight, Awana begins. And man, are we ready for Awana. Kids are ready. Parents are ready. Staff is ready. They're organized. Um, it's just going to be a tremendous time. And so we'll be ready for that. Pray about that, that God will do a wonderful work this year in our Awana program. That we'll see boys and girls that don't know the Lord as their Savior come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. That would be a great time as well. If you're going to go to Israel, the deposit is due on September 8th. And uh, I trust that if you are going to, you would reach out to me, let me know that. And then the American Heritage Girls begins on September 10th. If you are a widow in our, in our church, uh, there's a widow's luncheon, 1130. Uh, there's a sign-up desk. That's uh, September 10th. There's a sign-up at the welcome desk. And, of course, you can invite other widows from the community to come. And it's a, it's a sweet time. And it's not a morbid time. I make sure to tell you that. It's a great time to be renewed in the grace of the Lord and to enjoy uh, what he is doing in our lives. And, of course, ladies' ministry begins on September 17th. So all kinds of neat and wonderful announcements. We're praying for folks to be saved on the front of that. And then as you open up the bulletin, of course, we're praying for all of our ministries. And there's some continued prayer requests that are there. These requests have been phoned in, and they're listed in the middle. And I'll just read them quickly and, and give a little bit of commentary on that. Um, Devin Newton has asked us to pray.
we're spiritually at the throne of grace where we are invited to boldly and comfortably through the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's times like this when we weep with those that do weep and we rejoice with those that rejoice. We laugh, we cry. Um, but God, we've seen wonderful miracles come through the prayer time on Wednesday night. And so I agree with Brittany. There were a lot of praises tonight. And that, that, that's just to your glory. And I want to thank you for moving so mightily in, the li in our lives. Thank you for these praises that have come forward. And God, when you do something like that for us, we can hardly wait to get here on Wednesday night and just share it. And you just got to tell somebody. And what a joy it is to share it in this setting. Lord, there was a lot of requests tonight, too, with heavy hearts. And I think about the heavy hearts of those that are begging you and pleading and desiring so much for their loved ones, their mother, like Raul and others, to be saved. God, we realize that when we're praying for somebody to be saved, that you can use anything and everything in that life. You can use a kidney surgery from a six-year-old boy to win his dad. You, you, you can use a, a move. You can use a trip. I think of Lisette's mother traveling, and, and, and you just use anything. And so we pray that you would do that. I pray that there would be a peace that would comfort our hearts that we know that we can trust the promise that you're not willing that any should perish. And so I trust you for their souls, God. Lord, um, some are ill tonight. They need the great physician to touch them physically. I beg you to do that. Lord, some have some uh, decisions to make. They need wisdom. Some, Lord, have some financial needs, and I'm sure some have relational needs and job needs and other things, and I, I pray that you would meet those according to your, to your perfect will. Lord, we call it an unspoken when it's just too deep too painful, too embarrassing, whatever. But it's a need on our heart. And we know by the testimony of others that you do answer unspoken requests. And so for the unspokens tonight, meet them according to your word. Meet them according to your wonderful uh, abilities, God. I think of the Bailey family tonight. I lift, I lift them. I love my brother Chad. And his dad is in that moment where there will be a transition from this, this life to the presence of Jesus. I pray you strengthen him, God. I love his mother. His mother is a wonderful servant of the Lord, and she has fulfilled her vow. She stood at that altar, and she said, till death do us part. Fifty-eight years they've been married, and she's fulfilled her vow. Comfort her heart tonight, God. Give her a peace that only you give that passeth all understanding. Lord, I would ask you to move quickly and be merciful. Don't let Brother Bob just hang between two, two eternities here. Lord, I, I pray that you would just take him home and take him to be with you. Organize that service and all that will go with that, God, as only you can. Lord, some are in the hospital right now, and I pray that you would watch over them as well. Some are still grieving the loss of loved ones. I pray that you would minister to them as well. I, Lord, tonight I'm doing something I've never done before. And to be honest, if you don't empower it, then it's not, it's not going to mean much. But I believe you got a direction for me tonight. So... Would you do something unique in our service tonight, in our hearts, in our minds? Stretch us a little bit tonight. Help us to see um, the value of what we're about to do. And Lord, as we leave here, may it, may it spark in us a desire to further what you, you have done. And so we love you and thank you. Watch over us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you've been seated a while. Stand. Find those around you. Shake somebody's hand. Welcome to Bible study. And we'll come back for our lesson in just a moment.
may be seated. Love to watch you greet one another. It's part of a wonderful, wonderful part of a, a service to be able to do that. I hope you brought a Bible tonight. If you don't have a Bible, I need you to find or grab one out of the pew and, or, or get an electronic device somehow, but you're going to need to see a Bible for our service tonight. Um, and when you find, get your Bible, make your way, if you would please, to the book of First. Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, Pastor, where, where's that? It's in the New Testament, and you get into books like Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. Right after Colossians, you'll find the book of First Thessalonians. And God has laid on my heart through prayer and asking of Him what He would have me preach on Wednesday nights. For us to spend some time in the next few Wednesday nights in the books of First and Second Thessalonians. I actually will be preaching a little bit of a prophecy message on Sunday. And I'll pull some of that from First Thessalonians as it's Labor Day and so on. But I have been enjoying my time in the book. And I'm excited to preach to you on Wednesday night from the book. And um, it's a unique letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. Uh, he wrote this as we were so wonderfully, I mean wonderfully, preached to two weeks ago on a Sunday night by Brother Josh Yachter. He preached to us from this book, and he took us back to the book of Acts, chapter 17, where you find Paul in the city of Thessalonica, and you find the church beginning and he walked us all the way through that about that 30-day period in the life of the Apostle Paul where he came to Thessalon Thessalonica, preached the gospel, folks got saved, a church sprung up, and then the devil showed up. He showed up through those Judaizers. Uh, you know there was a man there named Jason that was arrested. You know that the believers then came and got the Apostle Paul and got him out of the city of Thessalonica. And we know, as you, as you follow in the scripture, that he ends up in Athens uh, as the next place that he goes. And while he's in Athens, he's, he's burdened, of course, for the city of Thessalonica. And he's burdened there as to what is going on. He knows the uproar. And he knows all of these things. And um, he had tried himself by his own wording, and I'll show you that in a moment. He had tried to make his way back to that city, but he talks about how Satan hindered him from getting back there. And so because he himself could not get there, there is a time where the Apostle Paul sends Timothy back to Thessalonica. And if you get to chapter 3, if you would please, look at, if you would, at verse number six, and you will see that the letter, the epistle of this book was really motivated humanly by Timothy coming back to the Apostle Paul in Athens and giving a wonderful report of what was going on in the church, even though it was going through some difficult times. Verse number six says, but now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, and we also to see you. You will find that Paul says in his own vernacular in verse number seven, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. And so Timothy goes back to Thessalonica, meets with the church, and, and in most part, in large part, comes back to the Apostle Paul and gives a good review that, hey, their faith is strong, they're steadfast, uh, there's a joy there, there's, the church is still there, the church still misses you, the church desires to see you. And, and this was important to the Apostle Paul. And obviously this report somehow 
spurred him to want to move to write them epistle. And so the Lord Jesus, knowing that, and the Holy Spirit, knowing that, inspired Paul to write this letter. And the reason I say inspire is because this epistle we know may have been pinned by the hand of Paul, but it is, it, um, it, it is inspired by God and it is the word of God. And so Paul writes a letter back to them. Now, in that day, they didn't have cell phones. And they didn't have FaceTime. They have all these things, right? So the communication was not swift. And the communication was wonderfully, joyfully anticipated. So when news went to the church that a, that a letter has showed up from the Apostle Paul, the whole church gathers eagerly to hear this letter and to hear what the Apostle Paul is saying. And the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Lord, having the report from Timothy, pens his letter very carefully. Because yes, there is a nucleus in the church that is strong and a nucleus that is in the church that is growing and that is steadfast in the faith. But there's been some things and people that have crept into the church. And so had those people creeping into the church, some certain issues have crept up. And I need you to understand these issues so you understand what I'm going to do going forward. And I'm just going to tell you about them. First thing that happened was men started getting in there and they wanted uh, the, their, the limelight themselves and they wanted the glory themselves. And so they began to attack the Apostle Paul's character and they began to defame him and they began to uh, destroy him and try to belittle the Apostle Paul in the, in the mind of the church. And so they had some personal attacks. And the number one thing that they attacked was his motive for coming in there. And they were telling the church that the Apostle Paul was like a charlatan or he, he was a deceiver and he, he took you blind and, and you can't trust this man. He was here 30 days. He's gone. What did you really, you don't even know what he did to you. He's deceived you. We are here now. So therefore, you can trust us. Don't trust this dishonest man who had a dishonest motive coming into our, into our city. Matter of the fact, if you remember, when he came from Macedonia, they beat him to a pulp over there. So, so obviously, the guy's not trustworthy. Another issue that had come up was, was that... Um, they were they were they had begun to creep back into the immorality of the culture and so somehow in the church at Thessalonica holiness had been attacked purity had been attacked and these believers these folks that had been saved were were being tempted and pulled back into a life of immorality that was tied with that culture Another thing that was a problem was the second coming of the Lord, the rapture and those things. And there had been a lot of confusion going around. Um, and, and it was on multiple levels. For some, they were worried about the folks that had already died. What, what's going to happen to them when Jesus comes back? Did they miss out on this salvation thing that Paul was talking about? Are they forgotten? They know they're dead already, so they're not going to be able to be caught up off the earth. So what happens to them? I'll talk a little bit about that on Sunday. Then there were some that they, they, they took a good thing too far, and they said, well, since the Lord is going to come back, then we don't need to work. We don't need to do anything. We're just going to sit here and wait until the Lord comes back. Why would we do that? He's going to come back at any moment, and so there's no reason for me to do anything. I'm just going to wait and not work and just kind of do whatever. And then boredom was setting in, and they were having problems with that. Then there was also a crisis in leadership. Who was going to be in control, right? Okay, so these are all little issues. Now, when the whole church hears that a letter has been written, everybody shows up. Okay. The honest people, the immoral people, the, 
the guy that has been telling them all, you can't trust this guy, the people that are trying to steer them away in some confusion of doctrine, so, so they all have come to church, right? So just in your mind, get a picture that the letter has arrived, the announcement has gone out. You dare would not miss this service. So even if you hate Paul's guts, you got to be there, right? And so picture everybody coming together. Everybody has their agenda. Some are honest. Some are dishonest. And God has inspired Paul to write a letter. If you're with me mentally so far, say, say amen. All right. So let me give you my text verse. This is really going to freak you out. Come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And look, if you would, please, at verse number 27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be what? read unto all the holy brethren. Pastor, you've preached a lot of messages in your time here, but I've never heard you preach a message on a text about reading the Bible. Right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read the letter. What do you mean we're going to read the letter? We're going to read the letter. I charge you by the Lord, that this epistle be read out loud unto all the holy brethren. So normally when I introduce a series, I preach an introduction message. And when I preach an introduction message, it's just that. So I thought tonight, to introduce the book, we're going to read the whole book. Doesn't that excite you? I wish you could see your faces right now. There's just like this range of face going on. And some of you I'm not even going to look at again. So I was terrified to do this. And then I went to Nehemiah, and I remember what Ezra did. And the Bible said that after they built the wall, that Ezra made a, made a, made a pulpit, right? And, and he brought out the word of God. And the people had not heard the word of God read in so long because they had been in captivity. And as Ezra read the word, the Bible said the people just begin to weep hearing the Bible read. Now, I believe that the Bible has power. And so I kind of want to bathe you tonight by reading the word of God to you. And I want you to hear the letter and I want you to remember, while we're reading this, it, it's a man that's being attacked. The church is being attacked. You've got all types of people sitting there, some honest, some dishonest. Nobody has a clue what Paul has written. So when he makes a point about them, everybody's going... He's talking about you, brother. All right? This is going to be awesome. Now, don't lose me. Pastor, are we really going to read every word of all five chapters? Absolutely. I practiced it. It took me 15 minutes. It's 747. We got plenty of time. <laughs> Chapter 1, verse number 1. Let your eyes find the paper. And you're going to do some reading, too. Paul. And Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Give you a little Bible study. You'll always find grace and peace in that order. You will never find peace before you find grace. You find grace, then you find peace. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, 
and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and your faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. So Paul begins his letter. Now think about the strategy part of Paul here. He knows he's being a, yeah? I'm in 2 Thessalonians. I need to read... First Thessalonians. Thank you for having courage. Why didn't somebody else say something? Man, I'm into this, baby. I'm into this. All right. By the way, next Wednesday, Second Thessalonians. Verse number one. You know, that, that, that shows me why my point wasn't coming because I know in verse two, I wanted to say something about prayer. And I'm like, where is that verse? Okay, this is awesome. I think I am more nervous doing this than I am preaching to you on a Sunday morning. Paul and Sylvanus and Timotheus. That's the same way it started. In... <laughs> Under the church of the Thessalonians. That's the same way it starts. In... Okay. Am I with you? Are you with me? Okay. All right. All right, okay, we give thanks to God, verse 2, always for you all. By the way, you can trust somebody that prays for you. Making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God in our Father. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm saying it so I'm sure I'm right. All right, here we go. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God or your salvation. Now watch this. For our gospel came not unto you in word only. See, he's being attacked, and these guys are all words. He says, but also in what? Now, we've had this before, remember? The kingdom of God is not in word, but it's in power. Just because you profess to be a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. If truly Christ is in you, then the transformation of the gospel has made you new, the explosive power of the gospel. So Paul says to them, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. And you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So he's writing to that church and those men that are attacking their character are sitting there. And Paul says, now church, you know who we were when we came in to see you. And verse number six, ye became followers of us. And of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. He's taking them back to their salvation experience. He's taking them back to, even though there was affliction and problem going on, you received the gospel, you heard the word, it came in power, and in the joy of the Holy Ghost, you received that. You know, sometimes... You're, you're a Christian so long and you endure things that you forget there's joy in Jesus. And there's joy in our salvation. It does you good sometimes to revisit the day you got saved. So did they receive this, he says in verse number seven, so that you were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. He's saying we didn't point you to some fake Jesus. We didn't point you to some fake God. The Jesus we preach to you is the true and living God. And the evidence of that 
is that your life has been transformed to where you no longer serve idols, you serve him. And look at the peace it brought to you to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, the guy sitting out there that's saying, hey, your dead spouse is not going to be part of the rapture because they're dead. Or you're, you guys are looking for Jesus to come back, but you got to understand that when he comes back, he's coming back with vengeance and he's coming back with wrath. And so they, they, they were totally misunderstanding the rapture. So the guy sitting out there with a screwed up theology just got nailed by the Apostle Paul and talking about, hey, Jesus died, he was buried, he's risen again, and he is coming back. And when he comes back, he, he's coming back, and, 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 and you can trust he's coming back because he's going to deliver you from the wrath to come. You're going to be caught away before this earth faces the wrath of God. Chapter 2. He goes back to defending himself and in this the character onslaught. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain, but even after that we had suffered before, he's talking about the beatings he took in Macedonia because they were using that against him, and were shamefully entreated. We weren't guilty there. As you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. And by the way, thank you for men and women who are bold with the gospel. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God, to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing who? Men, but God. Paul said, listen, they're questioning my integrity and they're telling me that all I was was a men's pleaser to deceive you. Understand this, I'm not interested in my life pleasing men, I'm interested in my life pleasing God. By the way, verse number four of chapter two, it's God which trieth our hearts. What a statement. Just, 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 just sit there a minute and think about this. I can say whatever I want to say, but God knows my heart. God tries the heart. Boy, that'll keep you humble. Verse number five. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. I'll tell you, there's, that's, it's a wonderful freeing thing when you can say God is my witness, right? Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, what he was saying there is, as an apostle, I had a right, it was right for you to finance me. As an apostle, it would have been right for you to house me, it would have been right for you to feed me, and it would have been right for you to pay me. That, that really and truthfully, as an apostle, I, I was entitled to, if you want to use those words. He said, but we knew that you could not handle that and so look how he treated them in verse number seven. But we were gentle among you. This is good wisdom when you're witnessing Christ to somebody. Even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not just the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. I have this next part underlined. Because ye were, what class? I mean, he's, he's just, he's defending himself. He's got these, these guys out there that are telling the church that Paul's motives were just dishonest as could be and that he abused him. And Paul said, listen, we love you. 
we love you so much that if we could have given you our soul, we would give you our soul. We did not mistreat you. We nourished you as a nurse would nourish her children. We had rights that we denied ourselves so that there would be nothing that would hinder the work of God in your life. What an example to all of us. Verse number 9. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Man, they worked day jobs and preached at night and worked at night and preached in the day. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know... How we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Look at their heart in verse number 12. This was the exhortation. That ye would walk worthy of God. You just got to hear that phrase. Paul said we did everything we could do to encourage you that your walk would reflect the worthiness of the salvation of God in you, who hath called you unto his kingdom in glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. By the way, there's a difference in man's word than God's word. But as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. By the way, if the word of God has effectually worked in you, would you say amen? amen? For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. He says, now for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. He's talking about persecution here. The Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus, their own prophets, and they've persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. They forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. He's saying, listen, you suffered persecution just like we have, verse 17. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in what? Oh, man, you can, just, you can just feel those men that were questioning Paul's integrity squirming in their pew, right? I'm just picturing a lost sinner squirming in their pew when the gospel's being preached. You can tell when people are uncomfortable with the preaching. At least I can. Not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you. Even I, Paul, once and again, read the end of verse 18 out loud. Right. That's just like Satan, right? So Satan knows that these new believers are vulnerable. He knows they're getting fed this line of garbage. And, and, and he knows if the Apostle Paul can get back to Thessalonica, that he would straighten this all out. And Paul says with his own mouth, I tried twice to get there, and Satan hindered me. Pastor, sometimes I feel like Satan is hindering in my, me in my life. Yeah. If Satan can hinder the Apostle Paul, he can hinder us. When Satan hinders you, sometimes it's, 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 it's a gross hindrance. It, it prevented, think about this, it prevented probably the greatest Christian to ever walk the face of the earth from getting to Thessalonica. Paul said, he beat me here. Fascinating. He was coming back. Look, if you would, at verse, I'm lost. Thank you. For what is our hope? or joy, or crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. 
Boy, they had been attacking Paul, saying that he somehow got some kind of glory and joy by being this leader and what he took from them. Paul says, you got it all wrong, guys. Church family, you're our joy. You're our crown of rejoicing. Verse number one of chapter three, wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it be good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow labor in the gospel of Christ to establish you to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. What a statement, what a statement. So many times when things go wrong in our life or when we hear things that are not true or there's accusations made, they have the power to move us away from what we believe. They have the power to move us away from the people who love us the most. Always be careful at an accusation made to you about a spiritual leader. If somebody makes an accusation to you about me, deacon, Sunday school teacher, a godly person, they make an accusation, you hear that accusation, you come and grab them and say, let's go to the person we're accusing and let's find out the truth. Don't tolerate accusations without getting to the truth and coming to see the person. Be careful about that. Paul said, they're, they're, trying, to, they're trying to move me away from you or move you away from me. And I'm the one that loves you the most. I'm the one that's told you the truth. I'm the one that brought the gospel to you. But, but there's a separation that's trying to happen there. Verse number four. For verily when we were with, with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. Even as it came to pass, and you know, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. We read the verse about Timothy coming to see them. Verse number 7 says, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distresses by your faith. For now we live, if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Let me just pause right here. Do you get the heart of Paul? You get the heart of Paul? He's defending himself. He's caring for these believers. He's giving them the truth. Verse Chapter 4, verse number 1. We're almost done. Furthermore, then, speaking of the coming of the Lord, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have you that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to say those two words. Okay, so look at me. Your walk is to please God. Paul said, We taught you the gospel. Then we taught you the power of the gospel as it transforms you. I also taught you that as you have received of that, how that your walk in your life now is to please God. The number one person you ought to please in your life is God. So I just want to ask you this question. Are you living a life right now that pleases God? You have to answer that. So you would abound more and more. Verse number two, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Now here's their fornication. 
For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So they went back into sexual activity, sexual immorality. And, and I'm sure they probably had a guy in that church that probably wasn't a believer and was drawing them back into there. And so they were having this battle. Somebody was telling them uh, fornication is okay. God understands, blah, blah, blah. Paul says, no, 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 no. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Abstain from fornication. I think that's pretty clear. Verse number four, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in what? So he says, you, you need to know how to possess your body. You have the responsibility to possess your body in sanctification and in honor. It's your choice to give to that fornication or to not. I'm telling you it's the will of God for you not to do that. So you can just feel the two people that are having an affair in that church listening to that just kind of going like this. You can just feel the intensity of the guy that's, that's pulled his other brother into some immorality, just squirming. When Paul says, it's not God's will. By the way, church, if it wasn't God's will then, it's not God's will now. Verse number five. Not in the lust of concupiscence. Don't even stir up that. Even as the Gentiles, which know not God, speaking of the unsaved, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any manner, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. Wow. As we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto, say the word, holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God. What's he talking about there? If you're going to despise holiness, if you're going to despise somebody who, who, who is holy and who's not immoral, if you're going to despise somebody that's following God, you're not just despising them, you're despising God. Wow. Uh, verse 8, He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. They loved one another, man. For you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, you do it toward all the brethren, which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Okay, fellas, church, you're doing a great job loving one another. Keep it up and do it better. And that you study to be quiet and do your own business. And to work with your own hands as we have commanded you. Get your nose out of other people's business. Nothing will hurt a church more than your nose in their business. I'll say amen to that. Verse 12. That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. That's the unsaved. And that ye may have lack of nothing. But here, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. That ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, by the way, if we believe that, say amen. amen. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Can you not feel that guy squirming in his pew that said, they ain't going to make it. They're dead. They missed out. Paul says, no, they didn't. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Man, that's going to be a day. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another. I mean, the guys there were terrifying everybody. Last chapter. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. You don't know when it's going to happen. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. 
Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to what class? Wrath. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, now listen. These people are in darkness. You're not a child of darkness. You're a child of light, which means you're a child of the word of God. That day is going to overtake them because they're not looking for that day. But you know about that. Don't let their insecurity bring you to insecurity. Don't let their foolishness detect, take from you the authority of the word of God. You're not going to go through wrath. You've been delivered from wrath. You're not appointed under wrath. So stop freaking out that I added that. Verse number 10, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, edify one another, even as also you do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Well, oh, tell me you can see them squirming now, baby. <laughs> Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. And be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying or preachings. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Here's a wonderful biblical principle. Abstain from all, say it, appearance of evil. Oh. So not just sleeping with her. Don't even look like you're don't even don't even give an appearance of evil. So this guy's saying, no, come on, this is okay. Let's go do this. Paul says, no, warn them that are unruly. And by the way, let's do, let's do a good principle. Not only don't do evil, don't give the appearance. The appearance? What does that mean? That means if I look at Malcolm, I'd have seen his behavior righteousness and not, not to even be a shroud of, oh, what's he doing? Boy, if God's people would live with this principle, not giving an appearance of evil, that sure would do some things to our behavior. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who will also what? Do it. That's where Nike got their slogan. <laughs> Brethren, pray for us. We don't practice this one too much. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. <laughs> and I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. Would you read verse 28 out loud with me? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. We just read a whole book of the Bible. Fascinating. Let's pray. Let's go home. Heavenly Father, just to hear your word read out loud filled my soul. Paul said, make sure you read this to all the holy brethren. And so we read it to all the holy brethren tonight. We're going to enjoy this book. It's a little love letter that Paul wrote to encourage God's people. And I'm going to take the book and we're going to encourage ourselves. And some of the things they went through are some of the things we go through. Wonderful practical application and teaching will come from this. Minister to us, I pray. Lord, I pray that the reading of the Bible will inspire us to go and read more. Read more. Read more. Oh, how we need the Word of God. Thank you for loving us now. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, our song to go home is hymn 406. One verse couldn't be better. Wonderful words of life. Stand if you would. See you Sunday. God bless you. Sing
him over again to me wonderful words of life let me more of their beauty see wonderful words of life words of life and beauty teach me faith and duty beautiful words 